entrepreneur and educator, Ms. Jamie Alalaw. Mm. So Ms. Jamie is originally from California, and she went to school out there, <laughs> and she studied <laughs> classical voice and African American studies, and she does a lot of different things. She moved to Atlanta what year? 2010. 2010, she went to Atlanta. She performed in Porgy and Bess, which is coming next year to the Atlanta Opera, and they're interested in student involvement. Um, so keep that in your brains, friends. But um, Ms. Jamie currently operates her own music educational program, teaching lessons in piano and voice to all ages. She also um, does different um, outreach programs and presentations like she's doing today. And she works very closely with the Atlanta Opera with their Opera on the Beltline initiatives. And she is coming up with her own um, programs and workshops using that partnership and other partnerships as well. So she's very multi-talented, and we're very um, blessed to have her. And she's take it away. Hello, y'all. Thank you, Dr. Davis. She's Dr. Davis, y'all. <laughs> um, yes, my name is Jamie Ali Law. And um, Dr. Davis and I have been talking a while ago. I forget how the subject even came up. But um, we were talking about opera and the storylines and synopsis and um, you know, I was I was talking about how when I explain to people about operas when they're getting ready to come see me or whatever, I tell them to read the synopsis. Or I'll be like, okay, what had happened was, mm -hmm. and then I'll just kind of break it down. Like, mm -hmm. this girl did this, you know, whatever. And so we started to just talk about um, the accessibility of opera, especially for audiences that just don't tend to engage with opera. And um, we came up with this Opera be like oh. Oh. Um, but we came up with this uh, opera be like um, conversation and then uh, and and then dr. Davis was like oh and I also want you to come in and just talk about some of the things that you have going on just in the music world just in general so I was like okay what <laughs> What is this presentation, really? So, um, it is creating space for yourself in an unfamiliar world. So, um, this, y'all got me so excited about this. Um, this whole new world. It is a wonderful world. Okay, so, first off, how I met opera. So, my story, the beginning, in the beginning. Um, I've always sung. I love singing. Started singing in choirs, fifth grade all through school, um, college, I was dabbling. I didn't know if it was gonna be music or dance. So I just took classes, a little bit of both. I finally decided, okay, I'm gonna do music, um, but I also sparked a passion for Pan-African studies. So, went to go ahead and transfer to California State University, Northridge, which is where I went. And they have a program there <laughs> called Breath Studies in their music department. And basically what it is, is that you can combine a music major with something else. And so I was like, ooh, this is dope. It's a, um, it's a, back, a Bachelor of Arts degree. And I was like, okay, so I'm gonna do music and Pan-African Studies. I'm gonna make my own degree. So I went in to audition for the voice faculty because you have to audition if you're gonna be in the department. My instrument is voice. So I went in and I sang and you know, they were, you know, just professional, cordial, thank you so much. Do you have any questions? I say, yes, I'd like more information on your breath studies program. And they looked at each other and they said, for what? Because mm. I'm interested in it. And they said, no, 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 you're gonna do voice studies. What is that? I said, oh, okay. They said, well, it's classical and opera. Opera, uh, okay, like I know, you know, Bugs Bunny, I've seen the opera before, like I get the gist. Never had an interest in it, never even crossed my radar. But I thought it was very interesting, and I like to sing, so I went ahead and picked a whole major. <laughs> um, so got in there and just was like, wow, this is completely me. It resonates. My voice is big. I got this shape going on, which is vibrato. I was like, okay, that's what that is. Um, I'm very dramatic very big personality, I love costumes. I was like, this is the place for me. So I fell in love um, with opera. But then I said, do black people even sing opera? Like that was a question that I asked myself. 
And um, just a little detour, after my first year, or no, 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 no. As soon as I was getting ready to start my first year at Cal State Northridge, I had, um, I was in the Army Reserves. So I had done that whole enlistment thing, went to basic training, came home, went to Cal State to transfer, got accepted, started my first semester. <laughs> Two weeks in, I got deployed to Northern Iraq. So um, while I was there, I was like, you know what, I want to keep my momentum going. Hey, y'all, come on in. Um, I'm just telling my story on how I met Opera. Um, so uh, got deployed and was determined to keep the momentum going. So I called my sister up, my older sister, and I was like, Jade, go to the record store. Because we had record stores then. <laughs> <laughs> Way back in, what, 2004? Oh, my goodness. Um, and so I was like, go, go to the opera section and just pick up like a couple CDs with black people on them. <laughs> I just went, just black opera singer. Well, she did not disappoint. She sent me the CD, uh, The Essential Leontine Price. Mm -hmm. So she was my introduction to opera. So my sister, she done real good, done real good. So, um, so yeah, while I was over there, I was listening and kind of getting acquainted, getting immersed um, in opera. So I came back, hit, hit the thing hard. Um, so, um, but I, I did, I found that I wanted to see myself in this space. Um, I, and it's, it, I, I am in, I'm, in, I'm comfortable in non-black spaces. I'm comfortable in majority white spaces. My school, I was one of three black people in my graduating class. I went to school in Simi Valley, California. And so I am comfortable and familiar with those spaces. And also I, I like to see myself represented. So I did, I did lots of research, um, checked up on people, started looking at, um, you know, I saw, came across Leontine Price, Kathleen Battle, Jesse Norman, I was like, okay, they're great. Are there people like my age doing this? And so I started to look at young artist programs and came across Laquita Mitchell um, and just some other young people who were doing it and it just really kind of fed me a little bit. Um, Okay, so obviously like so so what I started to establish for myself in this realm for my own comfort and to to feel more expressive is this notion of bring it to you and you to it. So I like I said, I you know, I did research. I wanted to see myself represented in this space. And I also, as I was looking at the synopsis and learning these characters and everything, I'm like, okay, I need a translator for my own self. Because I'm reading these stories, and I'm like, oh, baby, why are you doing this to yourself? Well, I, like, I, could not, I could not relate. So I put, I put, like, for example, the magic flute. So anybody familiar with the story of the magic flute? Okay, so you got this young lady, Pamina which I'm a, I'm a soprano, right? So that was, you know, the type of role that I would be looking at. So I'm looking at her, and so it's like, okay. So you got Pamina, and she makes this, no, 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 she, she, um, oh my goodness. I'm losing the story. So you got Tamino, right? So he comes out, he's the boy, because there's a boy. He comes out, <laughs> there's this uh, dragon type thing that comes, he gets scared, passes out, right? Then you got these three ladies, called the three ladies, and they come through, kill the dragon, and they're like, ooh, he cute. Let's go tell the queen about him, right? So it's like, oh, this guy would be great, you know, to go and save Palmina, all of this, right? So anyway, long story short, she meets this dude. She falls in love instantaneously. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> then he decides, you know, from her perspective, he decides... To not talk to her, right? So she's up to him like, Tamino, Tamino. And he's silent, giving her the silent treatment. She doesn't know he's going through a trial where he's not allowed to talk. But she's just like, why he not talking to me? Oh, my goodness. I feel it. I'm going to go and cry and in my life because he's not talking to me. So I'm, like, translating this stuff. And I'm just like, okay. 
mm, having a hard time. But at least when I get the translations, I'm like, okay, maybe I can find myself in this somewhere or bring it closer to me. So, all of this. This is me, right? Like, I'm a woman. I'm a mother. I have a 16-year-old daughter. She is a wonderful person. Um, <laughs> Pan-African studies. I love it. I love black folks. I love learning about black folks all around the world and here. Contributions we've made. Love it. I'm a performer, clearly. Veteran. I was in army. Scholar. Love school. Love studying. Love reading. So I've got all of this going on. And it just felt like it was at conflict because it's like, how does this stuff come together? Like, when I was in college, sincerely, the hugest struggle was between being a performer, a veteran, and Pan-African Studies. We're really the veteran of Pan-African Studies because there's some real mm. interesting dynamics that happen there, but we don't have to go into that. Mm. But um, just all of this was me. He's, you know, he's like right there. So <laughs> all of this is me. And I'm like, it just feels like a dis disjointed thing, right? And I'm a Libra. I don't know if that matters to any of y'all. But I really, really, really <laughs> crave balance. Like, I need it all to come together and to make sense. So you got all of this happening, and it's like, what brings it together? Bam. The voice. So, I am not my job title. You saw that last slide, all of this, I've got all of those things going on, um, and no one thing defines me, right? So you say, Jamie the opera singer, yes, that is one thing that I do. Jamie the mother, yes, that is a very important aspect of my life. But when you take any of these titles, none of them encompasses me. And so I just, I really um, do the work to get to the core of who I am and what I am here, why I'm here, right? So for me, I've identified that my purpose in this life is unity, unifying people to each other, unifying people to themselves, uh, kumbaya situations. Mm -hmm. um, my mission, to empower, to enrich, and to edify. So these are just kind of general, like big concepts. And so what I've found is that it really does not matter what lane I'm doing that in, as long as this is my foundation, right? So I can be working anywhere or doing any job as long as it is fueled by these things, then I can feel fulfilled. Um, but for me, at this space, what I've identified, you know, in terms of this empowered place, empower the voices of women. I love all people. I want all people to be empowered. I also am aware that the voices of women have been missing from much of the dialogue around the world and it shows, right? So I'm all about, okay, ladies, let's, you know, rise up, let our voices be heard so we can, again, restore balance. Um, I also have a mission and desire to expand opera and classical audiences and educate existing audiences on the contributions of African Americans. So this was a mission that um, I developed while I was in college. Um, during junior year, my voice teacher, she was like, well, you know you could put spirituals on your recital. I was like, oh, what? Very excited. It was over after that, right? So you will hear spirituals out of me from the beginning to the end, okay? Um, but then, there it is. Um, but then I was like, well, do black people compose, right? Like, do original compositions? These are questions. I'm at a primary white institute. Um, and institution, and these are questions that I'm asking myself, again, looking for representation. So I start doing research and come across some amazing people. A mentor of mine is at um, UC Irvine, Dr. Darrell Taylor, and he runs the African American Art Song Alliance. And so I had access to just some really great, juicy stuff, came across um, compilation books and stuff like that. And so I was bringing stuff to my teacher. And she was like, oh, this is great. Why haven't I heard of it? I said, I don't know. You know, so that put me on a mission to just really, you know, expand opera audiences because I like to see me when I look out in the audience and also to educate the existing audiences because clearly people who are familiar with the field are less familiar with the contributions that African Americans have made. Asking folk, perform, I'm trying to put the words together. 
composers, as performers, you know, every aspect of the industry. Oh, and um, self-actualization and support of others and doing the same. Like, I want to be all I can be, and I want y'all to be that too. Okay, so Dr. Davis talked about some of the things that I do. So here are some of the things that I do. Um, I am a, a resident artist with the Atlanta Opera. That is not an official title that you will find on their website. <laughs> it is a title that was pretty much bestowed on me because I'd be up in there doing all of the things. Um, when I moved to Atlanta in 2010, I had just finished grad school. My daughter was seven. We came out here because we loved Atlanta. My mom was working on her master's degree at Georgia State. So I was like, let's do it, let's move. And plus, it's real close to New York. Older sister was in New York at the time. I was doing the whole audition thing, flying back and forth. That got old. <laughs> it got old because I am a mother. And my daughter was young. And I, you know, I'm like, I'm going up here and auditioning. But what if I get something in Montana? Girl, you ain't going to Montana. You know, like, these are the serious conversations that I have with myself. So I started to have to really establish um, a career that fit me rather than trying to find follow the trajectory. Okay, you graduate, young artist program, this, this, that, this is what you do. That, and it, does, it, it doesn't work like that for many people. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so but anyway, uh, Atlanta uh, Opera, I came in. Um, it was when they were doing Porgy and Bess, so I was blessed to get connected with the course master, get in on that show. That was my first show with them. I did, um, what time were we at? Because I have, um, oh, okay. Okay, cool. All right, so actually I have, um, I don't know if it's worth it to go out. So really, I did these PowerPoints for myself so that I could keep myself on track, just so y'all know. But I was like, okay, well, you know, they can look at some things too. Okay, so Atlanta Opera Chorus. I did Opera Chorus from 2010 to 2016. These are the operas or the shows that I did. Um, the, oh, sorry. Porgy and Bess and Chia de Lemonmore. Those first two shows, my baby got to be in it with me. She was so cute. Um, Don Giovanni, Carmen, La Traviata, Tosca. Um, Walter Huff had been with the Atlanta Opera for, what was it, 25 years at that point. So we had a special, um, oh, bless your heart. I'm sorry, yes. I didn't see. I really wanted to see. Oh, well, that helps me too. So, <laughs> um, but, so we had a, a, a celebration for him. Uh, Le Noce di Figaro and uh, Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like I said, I decided that I didn't want to do the back and forth thing. So I started to look for and create opportunities for myself at the Atlanta Opera. Um, they started to engage me in um, donor events. So they would have me go and sing um, for events where they were um, entertaining donors. And I was like, okay, this is cool. Then they would start having me do community outreach events. Um, and these are just some of the events that we would do. Some of the, um, some of the lo locations they would have me go out to. So they have this uh, event that they do at the beginning of the season called Opera with an Edge. And so the host used to be Bob Edge. And he would um, introduce the season, the upcoming season, and we would do snippets from there. So I've, I've done that um, often at the Hyde Museum. The top picture right there was when the um, Gordon Parks segregation story exhibit was at the Hyde. And so um, the opera, the, the niche that I made for myself at the opera is twofold. One, I love doing all things black. Two, um, I do weird things. Like I will do unconventional, unconventional non-traditional things. Because again, it's my mission to expand opera audiences. So I will go to people who don't typically listen to opera, or I will bring to the opera to, to the opera things that are not what you would typically see in that space. Um, so I did. Um, I called it a musical response to that exhibit, and what I did was I went through 
and just let the pictures speak to me. So I would sing songs that those pictures kind of evoke from. Um, and then down at the bottom, as Dr. Davis said, we did a collaboration with the um, Atlanta Beltline where we literally were out there um, singing on the Beltline. And people were riding the bikes by and were like, what is going on? <laughs> No. Make a wish. No. That you talking about this car sheet? You shop which which one? I heart W A. Oh, that is Lois Wrightus from W A V E. Okay. So you got Lois Wrightus. You got Jessica Kiger with the Atlanta Opera, and then you have uh, car sheet car Alvarado Sims, mm -hmm. who is uh, uh, an amazing historian. Uh, and so we were actually performing with her exhibit. You might have seen it out on the Beltline, the pictures. Um, the uh, Atlanta and the Civil Rights Movement along the Beltline. So that's her exhibit. And so that's what we were um, performing with. Um, I'm a teaching artist with the Atlanta Opera. So I've started to create um, educational content for them. The first thing that we did was tapestry. Explore and create spirituals, so it's geared towards um, elementary students. And what we do is we provide a little bit of education, information about spirituals, their origins, um, and then we give them the opportunity to write their own. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's so cute. Oh, it's so cute. Um, and then we've got, um, and I do this in collaboration with Dr. Um, well, she's not Dr. yet. She close. Brittany Boykin. Um, she's and she's. Uh, the assistant director for the conductor for the Glee Club, Spelman Spell Spell Glee Club. Spell mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Spell oh, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Yes. So she and I are collaborators on the educational content. So we've got Tapestry, which has been unleashed, released, and then Georgia Songbirds is um, a work in progress. That's going to be our next one. Studio tours. Um, so I've done a couple studio tours with the Atlanta Opera. The first one I did was. And mis palabras, I was Ana Maria, little Mexican girl, in a bilingual opera. That was fun. And so that's what that was from. And then um, we did The Marriage of Figaro, and I sang the role of Susana. Oh, I think that's it for this one. Okay, so, yeah, so with the Atlanta Opera, it was really about, um, I want to sing opera. I don't want to travel and audition, so I established a relationship with them as such to where um, I could provide them value and they could provide me with opportunities to perform and do the singing thing. Uh, Daz Garage Theater, anyone heard of them? So Daz Garage Theater Company is a comedic improv company in town in the 044 and you know, anybody familiar with the show, Whose Line It Is, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Yes. Yeah. Right, so it's the same premise, right? And um, in fact, Colin Mockery comes and performs with us probably about twice a year. I, I couldn't find any pictures of him in my stuff when I was putting this together. But, um, so I'm a general company member with Daz Raj Theater. So again, like I said, with the Atlanta Opera, one of the reasons why they like me there is because I do weird stuff. So we had an opportunity, um, what was that, 2015, I think it was, where um, the artistic director at Daz Garage approached some of the arts organizations in town and said, hey, can you give us some artists? We'll do like a crash improv training with them and do a collaborative performance because they had um, this fundraising event called Daz Garage and Friends. Um, and so I was one of the people who went in, um, did this crash training, and I loved it. Scary, so scary, so fun. Because you don't know what you're gonna say, literally. Like, you're improvising everything. And then we started to add the element of music on top of that. So we're not only improvising words, we're in improvising music as well, right? So um, not a lot of opera singers like that. We like our music on the page. <laughs> Right, so that was one of those things where I was like, well, this is something that I enjoy doing. And so um, we did that show, it was really fun. And so we started doing a few more shows and there were about four of us from the opera who just kind of kept hanging around. 
and they invited us to be general company members for the theater. So it's not even just like, oh, they're the Atlanta opera people. Like, we're dad's garage improvisers now. So I do straight improv without the music, and I do it with the music stuff, too. Um, so Improper. So Improper is a group that we created out of that collaboration, and it is opera singers, improvisers, come together, everybody's improvising, everybody's singing operatically. So the, the element of that, op, that comedic bent is that you've got these improvisers who do not sing, or who do not sing opera, but everybody's up there singing operatically, going full out. Um, so it's really, it's really fun, we do lots of games, and um, you know, we'll even improvi improvise 22 minute operas. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it sounds scary, and it is, and it's fun. <laughs> and actually, we will have the opportunity, you, you have the opportunity to see us because we will be joining in with the um, workshop. opera workshop performance on the tw April, 22nd. April 22nd. So we'll be, um, some of the members of Improper will be coming through to perform and do some of that cool. weird stuff that we do. Um, so this, and this picture was from the show, one of the shows we did there, Kanye Saves Christmas. Ridiculous. Um, so the guy who puts it together does this um, Kanye West impression, and so he hosts the entire show as Kanye, and it's like he's bringing his friends in, and you know, just everything. But Wicked, they um, they recently, or actually a couple of years ago, they did this show Wicked, not Wicked, um, but basically the premise of the show is that it's a um, it's telling of. It's, it's taken from Star Wars, and it's the telling of the Battle of Endor from the perspective of the Ewoks. So, uh, so yes, it's a it's a parody show. Um, you've got all of your cast of characters from Star Wars, um, but you've got some kind of musical uh, motifs from different, uh, like from Wicked and from different shows that might be familiar. I, I did two roles in that show. So I was Tebow, an, e an Ewok, who rapped. So I got to rap in that show. I was very excited about that. And then I sang the role of the Ensign, who, spoiler, spoiler alert, at the end we find that the Ensign um, is actually um, Snow. Anyway, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the story of the Star Wars. If not, that doesn't matter to you. Um, but uh, anyway, so that was fun. Fun show we did there. Uh, and then Dad's Garage and Friends. So this was, we did this show at um, the Fox Theater. And what, what we were doing there so involved was we were singing uh, Kanye West tweets with such passion and power. <laughs> Um, and yes, some other general foolishness. So they do, they do scandal. It's an improvised soap opera that they do um, every Saturday. I think it just closed, but they have a different set uh, setting each um, each season. Um, Flo Octavia. So Flo Octavia is a character that I created, and she is a rapper whose methodology is opera. So basically, I sing rap songs operatically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then also, like, I did a um, ludicrous operatic tribute um, where basically it was just kind of a mashup of ludicrous songs set to Beethoven's fifth. I think it was big fun, big fun. Um, so yeah, Daz Rosh Theater. Um, music After School. Um, I am founder, CEO, and program director of Music After School. Music After School offers is a. Um, let me see if I can open this up. Music After School offers after school enrichment. So we take piano and voice lessons to schools, um, and we also offer in home lessons. So we're currently at three different schools: um, two elementary schools and one high school, and. We also like yeah, we offer the in home lessons. So got our website. This is nice. Some little babies. Um about us. I've clicked on some things. Music after school was created to serve musical needs, you know, all of that. Um 
from the court coaching. So my newest venture is I am a leadership and life coach. And anybody familiar with life coaching? Somebody tell me what you think life coaching is. Yes, ma'am. Like someone to help you get through, like, uh, uh, just like the everyday life, like someone to help you through, like, problems and stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. Anybody else? No, she's like, nope, nope. Stretching, stretching. <laughs> yes. I was going to say, like, a life coach is almost like your personal therapist, in a sense. So basically, what you want to do is, like, all right, I come see my life coach. We talk about my life, we talk about what we're gonna do, but the life coach the life coach has like advice and essential things that you can do, whatever problem you're going with. So like a therapist, but not like, okay, tell me your problems, no, we're working through it together. Yes. I love that you added the together part of it. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, a lot of what you said, both of you are um, elements of it. And it really is about a partnership to partner with you to get your life, right? Mm -hmm. Um, familiar with I all know fix your life. Yeah. So hers is kind of, you know, like therapy, coaching, consulting all together, right? So, you know, the, the um, I make distinctions in life coaching. I'm not a therapist in that, you know, I'm not there. There are certain clinical ir uh, issues that I don't go into. Um, but also as a life coach, we focus on the present and the future. And so it's like, I have this plan. I have this purpose. I have this goal. Um, I've got, you know, this thing that I want to do, I'm not sure, I'm like, I'm hitting a ceiling, or I'm not sure how to get there, and I walk with you. I'm not an expert on it, so I'm not a consultant. I'm not like, okay, this is what you need to do, do this, 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 and this. But really, what I do is I partner with people to kind of reflect back to them stuff, right? Because, like, we have blind spots, right? It's like, oh, I don't know how to do this. And it's like, do you realize that you just said, oh, snap, I don't realize I just said that. And so a lot, of, a lot of my job is just really like reflecting back to people. Like this is what you said, this is what you're doing. Because we tend to go blind to certain things when they become habits. And just by having that light turned on, we have access to so much more of who we are and what we can do. So, um, you know, I just help people see stuff and provide support, accountability if you need it. If it's like, listen, I've been trying to lose these 40 pounds for 40 years. <laughs> you know, I want to do something different, and I'm like, okay, let's do it. And we get a different perspective of it, and then also I'm there to support you and be like, hey, remember, this is what we said we were going to do. What else do you need? No judgment, right? Because it's like we're all whole, complete human beings. Sometimes things are missing, so we help you find pieces, right? So with this... <coughs> I do one-on-one um, -on -one coaching and my ideal clients, I, you know, I coach powerful women of color who have experienced success in traditionally masculine areas, right? Makes sense, veteran, you know, I come from these spaces. Um, and women whose voices need to be heard louder, further, and more clearly. Again, like I said, the thing that unifies everything that I do is the voice, my investment in the voice. And I say the inner voice coach because it's like, okay, we need to, especially as women, but all of us, we really need to access our and listen to our inner voices, empower our speaking voices, and we might even need to free our singing voices, right? So I do vocal coaching as well. Um, I do workshops, authors, so I, I write a blog, and I'm currently working on a book. Um, public speaking, um, like I'm speaking publicly right now. Um, but, you know, just really, these are just some of the areas that I like to... Um, focus on in speaking. And then of course, we have Jamie Ali Law Soprano, cause you know, I'm a creator and a performer. So I'm out here singing. And like I said, because I was not, because I was not doing the audition thing back and forth, I had to create my own opportunities if I wanted to be active. So I've be, definitely become a creator with that. Um, so one of the things I created was La Femme Noire, The Celebrated Woman. And what that is is a program um, that celebrates the contribution of black women as composers, as performers, and as poets. And on that program, we feature the works of composers, including Brittany Boykin 
and she actually is my uh, collaborative pian pianist for that program. We also have a narrator, which uh, you see the camera woman right here, uh, Marsha, who is actually my sister. Um, but she, dynamic narrator um, and actress to, um, to dramatically portray the, um, the poems that are featured in, in the program. Um, and then uh, the Olakun Consortium is a very exciting thing that is in the works um, with another local singer, Minka Wilts, in the area. A lot of exciting stuff coming out of there. And audition season is coming. I have decided, my sister, or my sister, my daughter, like I said, is 16, and I have decided I'm ready to get back out there. Mm -hmm. Because now, if Montana calls me and they paying me, a sister might go. So, um, <laughs> so, So that's, that's been my journey. Um, as you can see, I got a lot of stuff going on that I'm doing in so many different realms. Um, they're all unified in me, in who I am, and that's where they all branch out from. Um, I'm not saying that y'all have to go out there and do all of the things, but really this, this is just an opportunity to look even beyond music to see what your interests are and see how you can bring yourself to that and how you can bring that to yourself. Um, how did I talk about that? I don't know if there's any time for questions. Yes. Okay, I have a few questions for you. Okay, he wrote them out. Yes, let me take out my jacket. <laughs> my first question is, how do you manage to handle all of these things such as being, I won't say, um, I won't say being a mother, so, so to speak, because that's like, you know, that's at home, but like all these business ventures that you have, such as you get from school, such as um, Dad's Garage Company, all those things, but how do you manage those? Um, well, and, and mother is definitely one to put in there too, right? Mm -hmm, um, definitely. So, amazing support systems. Like I said, my sister is here right now. We're also with my mother. Um, so my mom is here. My older sister moved down here from New York. Um, so I have an amazing family. I have great friends. My daughter has great friends. Um, so we even have like an extended support system in that way that, that helps out with some things. Um, I have wonderful colleagues, wonderful colleagues. So um, with Music After School, all of my teachers are colleagues. All of my teachers are people that I trust because I've worked with them before. And that just alleviates everything. They're all contractors. So they're responsible for, you know, they, they do it how they do it. I just kind of let them know this is where we're going. This is going to be the end point. And so that alleviates some of the responsibility from me. Um, you know, with Dad's Garage and with all of my performance opportunities, I get to choose, right? So, um, like, I'm going to be doing something with this Saturday. Um, I've got a couple things coming up at Dad's Garage. where So, basically, I'm, I'm picking and choosing my performance opportunities. Um, same thing with my coaching practice. I get to determine how many clients I'm going to coach. Right? So, everything that I do. Um, oh, and, and I'm a staff singer at Peachtree Presbyterian Church. So, that's another thing. So that's Wednesdays and Sundays. So that's my only kind of set schedule. Well, in my schools that I that I go to, but um, I get to determine all of that, um, and it ebbs and flows, right? So sometimes it's like, whoa, this is a whole lot, you know, for me, and I tap into my support systems there, and then sometimes it's, you know, a lot of times, it, you know, it just brings it back into balance. Balance is big. So that's that's how I do. Um, yes. Are you going to sing? <laughs> <laughs> that, was gonna be my, that was going to be my question. Well, let's 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 let's
conceptual stages. So Minka Wilts and I actually um, met, we actually, the first time we collaborated was for the Beltline uh, performance. And our voices love each other. Oh, they love each other. And so we're like, we got to do more of this. And then we started talking and found that we had similar experiences in the opera world and also have similar views on our place and our presence in the opera world and our desire to support those entering the opera world. Um, so it is very much about um, us establishing, well, us putting ourselves out there initially um, as the face of it, but also providing um, opportunities for performers. Um, I don't want to say too much, like I said, because it's still you mm -hmm. know conceptual, but. Um, but yeah. Yes. Okay, I have a question. So for music after school, yes. Have you do you currently or have you ever thought about incorporating music therapy? That is an excellent point, and I would love to have a conversation with you about that. We can have a nice uh, conversation. We can talk. We can talk. We can talk. We can talk. <laughs> yes. Yes. I would love to talk about that. Okay. Is that your major? That's what that's my career goal. Career goal. Okay. All right. Excellent. Again, so well, a lot of the goals is just trying to figure out how people who are current opera singers who are of color, specifically African American, what are the different things, how do we engage with the operatic field in different ways? There are a lot of different ways to do it. You can ask Ms. Hall, you can ask Dr. Adams, you can ask myself, you can ask Ms. Davis on how we engage. In, within operatic careers, and this is just one example, a very eclectic one at that, right? Um, and so, um, a couple things. April 22nd is the Opera Workshop Showcase. Ladies are working very hard, and proper will be there. There'll be some audience participation. I encourage all of you to come. That's a Monday at 7 o'clock p.m., April 22nd. It's a lot going on, I know, but please come and support your friends and um, ex um, experience a wonderful performance. Also, there is um, there are student recitals coming up, so once the hearings are passed, please let everybody know so that they can come and support. And um, there's a very important activity happening on Monday the 15th. We'll talk about it. Black Panther presents Keisha Jackson. Oh, okay. So, Google her. Before, 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 come on Monday. I came up here specifically for vocal 